Hi everyone, welcome to the Georgia Tech Astrobiology Distinguished Lecture for Fall 2021. Um, this le lecture is hosted by Georgia Tech Astrobiology and Georgia Tech Center for Space Technology and Research. And um, before jumping into the talk, we just wanted to mention a little bit about astrobiology at Georgia Tech. Um, and so today's event was planned in a joint effort between um, some astrobiology faculty and student organizers from the Explosion Student Group. Here on campus at GT, the Explosions Group is the Early Career Astrobiology and Space Science Organization, and we talk about concepts related to exploring the universe and studying the origins of life on Earth and elsewhere. And we just wanted to give a little shout out to Explosions, um, and if you're interested, uh, we have the website up here as well. And without further ado, um, what most <laughs> everybody is here for, um, so today for our talk, we are happy very, very happy to have um, Dr. Catherine Stack Morgan um, giving us a talk about the Mars 2020 rover mission. Um, and she she has received her PhD from Caltech in 2015, and now she's currently a research scientist at NASA JPL. And she wears many hats at JPL, including that of the deputy project scientist of the Perseverance rover mission. And she is also starting, also a participating scientists at the Curiosity Science team. Um, and with that, we will t you can take it away, Katie. All right, thank you. Um, I'll see if I can get sharing up and running here. Okay, can I confirm that the screen looks okay to you all? Yep, it looks great. All right, great. Well, thank you so much, Taylor, for the inv in invitation to speak with you all, and thanks to Georgia Tech Astrobiology for inviting me here. And particularly, thanks for being flexible with the timing of this talk. I got pulled into uh, the press briefing this morning for to, to celebrate our first sample acquisition uh, on, on Mars of Perseverance, and so had to shift this around a little bit. So thank you all for, for being flexible there. Um, so today, I'm gonna share with you uh, some early mission results from the Mars 2020 Perseverance rover. Um, during its first seven months of exploration within Jezero Crater. And you now most of you are, are familiar with this and you know this, but, but modern Mars today is, is inhospitable to life. It's a barren wasteland by most standards, um, but we have abundant evidence for habitable surface conditions on Mars prior to about three and a half billion years ago. And it's possible that Mars once looked a lot more like Earth than it certainly does today. Um, and, and Mars attracts our interest from an astrobiology uh, perspective because when we're searching for, for ancient life and, and, and seeking to understand the origins of life, the Earth is, is somewhat limited in its ability to provide us, us a record of the early solar system. We have plate tectonics, tectonics, which is constantly recycling the Earth's crust, and there's relatively few examples of rocks on Earth that are old enough to give us this window into the period of time when Earth, when life on Earth and possibly the solar system was emerging. Um, but on Mars, we have a pretty extensive ancient record of rocks um, from this period of early solar system time, uh, three and a half billion years and, and earlier. And so Mars is a really attractive place to search for possible Martian life and the conditions uh, likely required for its emergence in, in very ancient rocks. And so many of you are probably familiar with Mars exploration program goals. Um, and over the past uh, several decades, we've made great progress in, in advancing our understanding of the potential for life on Mars, what its climate and geology were like. And then every mission to Mars has, has an element that is preparing for human exploration through technology development. And you're probably also familiar with these themes of the Mars Exploration Program, follow the water, searching for habitable zones, and then seeking signs of, of life. And the Mars Exploration Rovers really hit the, the find the water, uh, search for water goal. And the Curiosity Rover uh, has really done a, a fantastic job of searching and finding for habitable zones on Mars. But the signs of life question still remains to be answered. And that's where the Perseverance Rover comes into play. So when we think about, about what signs of life on ancient Mars might look like, we can go and think about what signs of ancient life on Earth look like as well. And we think about life on Mars, that if it, if it was present and if it emerged, it was likely of the microbial variety. 
Um, we, we don't have any evidence to suggest that life, if it was present on Mars, progressed past relatively simple life forms. Um, and we certainly haven't yet detected or observed signs of life on Mars yet with our, with our rovers and spacecraft. Um, so if life existed on Mars, it was probably microscopic and based on what we know about life, simple life here on Earth, it was probably composed of soft organic matter that was relatively easily degraded and not particularly well preserved. And so this is a problem, of course, for a, a Mars rover looking to find signs of ancient life on a planet like Mars that has been subjected to uh, billions of years of, of wind erosion and, and, and radiation, um, as well as the processes of lithification and diagenesis. Um, but, but fortunately, we know that microbes have the ability to interact with their environments, and sometimes they trap sediment or precipitate uh, amorphous materials or minerals that can allow them to preserve evidence that they were once there in the rocks. Um, and so this gives us some hope uh, that we can go to Mars, look at its ancient rock record, and seek signs of ancient life if it were ever present on Mars. So of course, life and, and seeking the signs of life in the form of biosignatures, as well as characterizing the prebiotic environments of Mars is, is still an outstanding question. Um, even though we've sent a number of, of missions to explore the surface of Mars, we also have some major questions that are unresolved regarding the, the geologic timescale of Mars. What was the timing of major impact events and volcanic activity? Uh, what was the timing and duration of aqueous activity at the surface? Um, and one thing we continue to struggle with is, is absolute age dates. We don't have the ability to do that for, for Mars, and that's such an important part of the geologic timescale that we've constructed for Earth. And so Mars, we rely on, on relative crater chronology, and it's an imperfect system. And so we still have major questions about where the major geologic events on Mars fall into a geologic history. And then Mars as a system as well is, I think, an untapped area of exploration. The past 50, 75 years on Earth has just been a revolution in our understanding of how, you know, major elemental reservoirs on, on Earth evolve over time through the use of, of isotopes and understanding the carbon, sulfur, and oxygen cycle. And these are things that we just don't yet know about for, for Mars. And I think there's the potential for really rich discoveries here in understanding Mars as a system. Uh, that can help us better understand how, what the interactions were between the planet's interior, its surface, and its atmosphere um, that can contribute to our understanding of what biological or abiotic processes and signatures would look like. And because we have these unresolved issues, and, and these are questions that are hard to tackle with a robotic explorer, Mars sample return uh, has really become the focus and thrust of NASA's Mars exploration program. And so Mars 2020 is part of a notional three mission Mars sample return campaign to bring samples from Mars back to Earth. So here we are uh, with the rover there. The idea is that Mars 2020 will collect samples uh, from the surface of Mars and either leave them on the surface of Mars or carry them to the follow on mission, which would at this point in time, given the development of the architecture, might involve a small fetch rover seen there at the bottom, as well as a sample return lander. Uh, once the samples are transferred to that return lander um, and transferred to the Mars Ascent Vehicle, or MAV, the samples would rendezvous with an orbiter that would then send those samples on a path to Earth to be uh, retrieved here. And so while this is a complex series of, of missions to orchestrate, uh, we have good experience with each different part of this. It's just a matter of putting it all together. Um, and I'll, I'll mention up front here that the first opportunity for the follow on mission is something around the 2026 time frame uh, with a potential return of samples to Earth as early as 2031. And so while not, you know, we, we have some time to wait still till the samples that Perseverance is, is set to collect will come back. Uh, I think those those years will go by quicker than we realize. Um, so as I mentioned, Mars 2020 uh, has an objective to collect samples and collect a returnable, compelling cache of scientific samples. Um, but that's just one of, of its main objectives. Um, like other rovers, it's sent to Mars to characterize the geology and habitability of the landing site where it is exploring, and of course, seeking those signs of ancient life. And previous missions, I think, have also had that similar goal of, of looking for signs of life. But I think what, and I hope I, to convince you of this, that the payload of Mars 2020 is uniquely well suited and, and better suited than any previous mission for actually detecting possible signs of ancient life in the rocks on Mars. And so the results of those first two objectives feed very nicely into the sample caching objective. 
and we use the instrument payload to really uh, inform what samples we should collect and what their scientific value is. And as I mentioned, as previous missions have, uh, Mars 2020 has an objective to prepare for human exploration, and there are some neat technology demonstrations that the rover carries with it uh, to enable that goal. So here's the Mars 2020 rover uh, and its science instrument payload. Um, these instruments are a mix of brand new instruments never flown to Mars before, as well as some instruments that have uh, heritage from, from previous instruments that are currently operating on Mars or, or have in the past. Um, on the mast of the rover, we have the MassCam Z zoomable panoramic camera, and this is heritage on the MassCam uh, instrument on the Curiosity rover. And SuperCam is in the same same boat there, uh, heritage from the ChemCam instrument on board Curiosity, uh, but with the which which uses LIBS and has a an, a camera. But with SuperCam, we have the addition of Raman spectroscopy as well as uh, visible uh, near infrared spectroscopy as well. Um, the Meta Weather Station is one of those instruments that contributes to the human exploration goal of the mission, um, and this is heritage on the REMS instrument from Curiosity. Then we get into the brand new instruments that have never flown to, whose technology has never been flown to Mars before. Um, and we have RIMFAX, which is, which is the first ground penetrating radar uh, to be brought to the surface of Mars, um, as well as the MOXIE instrument, which is a technology demonstration for that human exploration objectives, objective that turns uh, Martian carbon dioxide into oxygen with an eye towards the, the supporting humans and bringing them back home. Uh, by being able to, to show and demonstrate that we can make oxygen on the surface of Mars. Then we get to the arm uh, and the turret of the rover, and this is where those instruments that come in that I think really distinguish this rover from previous rovers that have come before. And so we have on the end of the rover the Sherlock and the Pixel instruments, and these provide us with an opportunity to map at a very fine scale, and the next slide will show this, uh, the elemental geochemistry of the rocks as well as their organic content and their mineralogy. And I think the ability to combine this fine scale textural information with these geochemical and organic information is really what allow, will allow Perseverance to make great progress in identifying potential biosignatures. And so the way that, that Mars 2020 and the Perseverance rover distinguishes itself from previous missions is its ability to actually collect intact rock cores for return to Earth, as well as the spatially resolved uh, geochemistry, mineralogy and organics. Pixel maps the elements and how they're distributed in the rock surface, and we have a great example here from uh, one of the, the lab versions of the Pixel and Sherlock instruments, with Sherlock detecting the organic matter and showing how it's distributed uh, in the rock. And this is an example of uh, an ancient stromatolite where you can see if we were to find such a rock on, on Mars, just looking at the, the image on the left, you may not necessarily be able to, to claim uh, with any great certainty that we were looking at a biosignature, a potential biosignature, when you overlay the Pixel and Sherlock maps and see the uh, perhaps unexpected distribution of certain elements like silica, calcium, and iron, and then detections of organic carbon uh, in association with those elements, um, that's when you start to think, okay, well, maybe maybe we have to or should invoke life as playing a role in creating this rock. And so by pairing these Pixel and Sherlock analyses, we can help identify microscopic biosignatures in the rocks that Perseverance explores. And these data sets will help us determine what types of environments the biosignatures were preserved in, and then the chemical conditions under which they were preserved. Um, and then this will help us better understand if we find signs of ancient life, if and how organisms interacted with their environments on ancient Mars. And so I'll talk a little bit about the landing site and familiarize you with the field site for the Perseverance rover. Uh, so Perseverance rover is exploring in a place called Jezero Crater. Um, it's perched on the western rim of the Isidus impact basin, which is one of the largest giant impact basins on the surface of Mars, which has been dated to about 3.9 billion years. And so Jezero is, is we think, somewhere between three, about 3.8 billion years old in terms of how old that crater is, though it's not been well dated. Um, the neat thing about this particular area of Mars is that we have on one end the Isidus impact basin, uh, but then we're right next door to a major volcanic center, Sirius Major, which has been dated to 3.5 to 3.8 billion years, again, as best we can with relative crater chronology. And so what we have at Jezero is, is nicely bookended by these two major geologic processes on Mars, this giant impact basin and, and these, these pretty intense volcanic, uh, this pretty intense volcanic activity. And so 
Jezero Crater was selected as the landing site for Perseverance. Uh, there were a number of Lake Delta sites on Mars, so you could ask, well, why this one? What's so special about it? And what we think is special about it is that it has one of the best preserved ancient lake and delta deposits on Mars. Um, we also have uh, very compelling mineral signatures here, the presence of carbonates as well as clays. Um, and I, I think it's actually unique to have a, a lake delta site plus carbonates. Um, and there aren't many places on Mars that have that combination. And so that mineralogical diversity, which may hint at a diversity of habitable environments, is what helped attract our attention to this location. We also have unequivocal evidence uh, that a body of water, standing body of water was present here in the crater because Jezero has an inlet valley and an outlet valley in addition to that well-preserved delta. So we know that the crater essentially filled up and, and overtopped and flowed out at some point. Um, and again, we have pretty good time constraints here as, as best one can on Mars. Um, and so we have about a 3.5 to 4 billion year window into planetary evolution provided by both the deposits within the crater and then hopefully exploration of the crater, crater rim um, and some of the basement rocks outside of the crater. Zooming into to the Jezero Delta and some of those uh, units that I mentioned uh, within the crater, um, we have, of course, much of the crater is taken up by the units of the crater floor and the Black Star is where Curiosity, or sorry, Perseverance is right now. Uh, and, and it landed on the, the crater floor and has been exploring those rocks since. Um, you can see the relationship with the Delta. Um, those carbonate deposits that I mentioned, those are present in what we, we term the marginal units. Uh, which are along the inner rim of the crater. And this has been exciting from an astrobiology potential and perspective um, because the, the shallow margin of the lake is exactly where you might expect to find precipitation of carbonates and, and perhaps uh, signs of ancient life preserved in those carbonates. So those are one of our, in addition to the delta, of course, one of the main astrobiology exploration targets of the rover. Um, we hope at some point to be able to reach the crater rim. And again, that will, we hope, provide an age constraint on the deposits within Jezero. And with this bedrock being perhaps even pre isidus impact, could provide some important age constraints on some of the major impact processes that have taken place on Mars as well. So we'll zoom into the Jezero Delta here and, and think a little bit about habitability um, and biosignature preservation. Uh, and thinking that within the context of any given environment, there might be also a range of micro environments that could be habitable and have the potential to preserve biosignatures. And we think that the Jezero Delta and the units around it are a great place uh, for us to focus on from an astrobiology perspective. We could go through some of the possible habitable environments that we think might have been present associated with ancient Lake Jezero, including the lake sediments, the lake margin that I mentioned. We also have the inlet river uh, and, of course, the water column. But of course, in order for Perseverance to, to find these signs of ancient life and for us to be able to study them when these samples come home, we have to also be able to preserve those biosignatures. So in particular, the, the mission is focused on the deep lake sediments, and, and we think we have those exposed in at least parts of the delta or delta remnants within Jezero, those lake margin sediments and the carbonates that I mentioned in the form of those lake margin precipitates. Um, and then, of course, the, the deltaic deposits themselves may, may be a place where biosignatures could be preserved. And so as we think about how this preservation might actually occur in these environments, um, we can, it, it'll help guide our search for biosignatures and help us interpret them, of course, when we find them. And you all are, are, are familiar with this being an astrobiology crew, um, but some of the examples of the types of things we would be looking for um, with the Perseverance rover, um, when we, when we talk about our search for biosignatures and looking for these traces of life preserved in, in the ancient rocks of Mars, um, we might be looking for microbial structures like the stromatolites or fossilized microbial mats that I, that I showed earlier. Um, if we were lucky, we could find body fossils, though I, I suspect that if, if these were present, there are things that we would likely have to wait until the samples come back in order to definitively identify something like this. And then biomarkers and, and the instruments like Sherlock have the ability to to actually detect organic molecules and characterize those, those molecules as well. So I think, again, the payload of, of Perseverance is uniquely well suited for the search for signs of ancient life and, and give us confidence that we will be able to identify possible biosignatures if and when we come across them. So now I'll shift uh, to talking a little bit about the uh, mission results uh, and early mission results. So this is one of my favorite images 
uh, captured by the high rise camera, which is on board the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter uh, during Perseverance's descent into Jezero Crater. And a lot of things have to go right and have perfect timing to get an image like this that you can see beautifully in that zoom in uh, Perseverance in its capsule uh, with the parachute deployed. So well on our way to landing in Jezero Crater. Uh, this is one of the, I think now and, and to be forever iconic images from Perseverance's successful landing in February uh, of 2021, where this image was actually taken from the descent stage, which is the part of the, the entry descent landing system that the rover descends on um, as part of the sky crane system. And the descent stage, of course, will at, at some point very quickly after this image was taken, uh, separate from the rover and fly off and crash into the surface of Mars. So in order to get this image, the descent stage has to snap that picture and then transfer that image along that cable that you see on the picture and transfer it to the rover. And then the rover sent that image back to us. So again, a series of, of uh, maneuvers to get these amazing images and, and really just takes our breath away seeing this kind of thing and, and really feeling feeling the, the rover landing in real time. And so I mentioned that uh, Perseverance landed on the, the present day floor of Jezero Crater at a place that we have named Octavia E. Butler Landing after the science fiction author. Um, and, and since then we have, so we're about two kilometers from the Delta, um, which was a little farther to be honest than we, I think most of the engineers predicted we would land. I think the prevailing opinion was that we might land just off the Delta because there's an area that's nice and smooth and flat there. Um, but things didn't, things, uh, shaped up to, to push us a little further away, which I think in the end has been, uh, really, really exciting for the science part of the mission because we've had the opportunity to really dig into the geologic units of the crater floor. And so I'll talk a little bit more about that with, with the rover data coming up. So this was our welcome to Jezero first image taken by the rover. Um, one of the advances that this rover has over, over Curiosity in particular is that its engineering cameras like the, the front has cams and, and the nav cams are in color. Um, and this is really, uh, really a great addition to this mission in that when we get these images down, which are the prime images we do our targeting on, um, we have the ability to see these rocks in color. And then that can be a great help when trying to select science targets. This is a very typical uh, Martian landscape, a lot of dust, a lot of dirt, uh, pebbles, and, and what look to be some some larger pieces of outcrop there in what we've called paver stones. And, and we've seen a lot of paver stones at this point in the mission. Um, and then, so we, we're there, we're excited about it um, and ready to explore the landing site. So I'll talk a little bit about some of our observations um, in and around the landing site. This was uh, one of the places we pulled up to and actually settled in while the Ingenuity helicopter, which uh, is a helicopter that rides along with the Perseverance rover, and I'll, I'll show that soon. Um, while it was doing its prime mission of a 60 day uh, set of, of, of five flights, um, this is where we, we pulled up um, and, and waited for the helicopter to do its thing. So again, uh, just at, off there in the distance, you can see some of the Delta deposits and I'll, I'll be zooming in there. So, uh, but we had a, a, a good first taste and first look of the Delta even from our landing site here. I mentioned the paver stones. This is a very typical, um, Example of what these paver stones look like on the surface of, of Jezero and um, mostly kind of low lying flat outcrops with this kind of very characteristic and interesting rubbly weathering surface texture where the, the rock tends to break down into kind of pebble granule sized pieces, which ended up being an important thing for us to consider when we did our first drill attempt, but I'll talk about that in a little bit. Okay, so this is a, a wild ride zoom in uh, using the Watson camera, which is a ride along part of the Sherlock instrument that captures beautiful uh, high resolution images of the rocks that we, we study. Um, and you can see this is an area that has been cleared off by the SuperCam laser. So we're seeing through that dust. And in the frame, just when you get at the closest in area, you can see these kind of purplish streaks, which we think are a coating on the rock. Um, but these rocks have been, I'll be honest, a little frustrating for us from a science perspective because there isn't a whole lot that we can see about these rocks um, simply from looking at these natural surfaces. Fortunately, Perseverance carries along with it um, an abrader. And so I'll show you in, in contrast what the abrasion tool is able to provide us. But 
through the combination of the dust, the surface texture, and these, these coatings, it's been pretty hard to actually see into the rocks and, and for us to determine exactly what they are. I'll show you results from the first SuperCam observation we did. We, we uh, targeted a rock called Moz, which is Navajo for Mars, and we had um, early in the mission, we worked with Navajo Nation on a naming scheme uh, to use Navajo words to name our, our area. Um, and this was the first SuperCam uh, lib spectrum that we got out. Um, what we saw in, in this rock and what we've seen in subsequent rocks is that these rocks, many of them tend to be hydrated. Um, and they have a pretty typical mafic composition. Um, that's not too surprising. Almost every rock that we have looked at in, in Gale Crater with Curiosity is also mafic. Um, but, but good to, to get that confirmation here as well. And, uh, we've since seen some, a, a more, uh, diverse set of minerals and, and compositions beyond simply just saying these rocks are mafic. Okay. So I'll, uh, we'll take a, a brief aside here to talk a little bit about the Ingenuity helicopter. Um, and what it is doing on the surface of Mars. So here's, this was my title slide, but also one of my favorite selfies of the mission so far. So we take this image with the Watson camera and we do this with the Molly camera on Curiosity as well. Um, but each one of these selfies has its own, the rover has its own uh, character and attitude in, in the image and that's kind of fun. So here we, we were able to capture uh, the mast moving where Perseverance is taking a, a side glance there at, at Ingenuity. Um, so a great image of, of the two parts of, of Mars 2020. Um, and this next image shows one of the first flights of the helicopter. And I could watch this particular GIF all day long as the helicopter goes up and then comes back down. And this was, uh, a, this video was built with, um, images from the Mascan Z camera. And so having this kind of video capability is really neat, especially when you have a flying buddy along with you for the ride. So as of just yesterday or two days ago, um, we have done 13 flights. Originally, Ingenuity was only planned to do five, but like many Martian spacecraft, it outlived its original lifetime and is still going strong. And we'll, we're likely to plan the 14th flight before Mars uh, goes into solar conjunction in a couple of weeks. And so while the technology demonstration is complete, um, Ingenuity has transitioned into an operations demo phase where we're working to understand how rovers and helicopters can work together to explore a landing site. And so we've used Ingenuity as a scout for Perseverance and, and we use the images both for a science perspective and also the engineers have started to use the images from the helicopter to aid in their drive assessments and mobility traverse assessments. And so I think we're, we're very much seeing in real time the, the value of having paired mission concepts like this. And so it's been really neat to see this uh, in action. And we've, we recently heard that we are gonna continue the Ingenuity uh, mission for as long as this little spacecraft is alive. And so we hope and expect to have more images from Ingenuity to come. And, and really these images help to fill a gap between what we see on the surface with the rover and then what we see from orbit with our orbiter images. And having that intermediate scale of images is actually quite helpful. Okay, so we'll talk a little bit about uh, recent measurements of the Mars atmosphere and environment. And again, the, the meta instrument package on Perseverance serves as the weather station. Um, and this is to better understand the modern environment of Mars, thinking about preparation for sending humans there and what kind of environmental conditions they would have to, to deal with. Of course, we also do science uh, of the modern Martian atmosphere with this, these instruments as well. And so here's the weather report from Jezero a couple of days ago. And this is a, a website that you all can go and visit. And they, they update this with the weather, weather results. So it's been a pretty chilly minus 115 degrees Fahrenheit and a not so balmy minus one to three degrees Fahrenheit. So pretty, pretty typical, pretty expected for Mars. Um, but one of the real, uh, unexpected observations we've made, uh, in an environmental atmospheric perspective, are these pretty intense and, and large dust lifting events. And so this is a great uh, image that tracks the, the passage of one of these dust lifting, lifting events through the scene. Um, and we actually were able, we had some of our other instruments on at the same time that this occurred. We had the meta instrument on, and so we were able to capture uh, what the wind was doing at the time. So you can see 
uh, the wind from this dust lifting event in red. And you can see those big spikes there compared to a time in green where there is no, no dust lifting event going on. So you can see those big spikes there and increase in the wind speed. Um, on this rover, we also have a set of microphones, including on the SuperCam instrument. And we turned that microphone on, happened to have it on during this, this event. And we're able to see within that audio signal, the huge wind gust and actually hear this dust lifting event. So a really nice example of the combined way that we can bring together our instruments to make in, uh, good observations of the modern Martian environment. And I mentioned MOXIE earlier on. Uh, we have successfully run MOXIE a number of times now on the surface, and we are well on our way to showing that that this type of instrumentation is capable of producing oxygen. And so I think the next step, uh, once once MOXIE has, has has done its thing and shown its thing, is is to scale this up um, to a level that would be useful for for humans uh, going to Mars and working and living on the surface. Okay, so we'll we'll come back to the geology results of the mission and talk a little bit about early results from the Jezero Delta. So as I mentioned, we landed about two kilometers from the Delta, but we've been able to observe uh, the Delta using the images uh, from the rover's cameras, in particular, uh, the telescopic imager um, associated with the SuperCam instrument called the remote micro imager. Um, and like a, kind of a running theme for Perseverance is that we take the MSL cameras from Curiosity and we turn them into color. Um, and, and this was true for the SuperCam RMI. CamCam RMI is a, is a black and white camera and, and SuperCam RMI is in color. And this is one of the early uh, images we got uh, with the RMI doing a long distance observation of the Delta front. And you can see that over there on the left, the edge of the Delta and a spectacular view of the Delta Scarp and these deposits uh, within the Scarp uh, where we can actually resolve individual boulders and get size measurements on these boulders and see very nicely dipping dipping beds and, and the geometry of these deposits as well, suggesting that we have uh, channel deposits of, of these boulder conglomerates. So I'll zoom in here in the next slide and so you can see what these look like up close. And again, that's, these images were just breathtaking when they first came down. The fact that we can actually resolve the individual boulders and make measurements on them to get to get paleohydrologic uh, conditions. So one of our early results in the mission is that while, of course, this is the Jezero Delta that we're, we're talking about, these upper deposits that we see in the Delta Scarp are actually surprisingly high energy um, and, and maybe significantly younger than than the main Delta deposition. So. I think we're already seeing multiple episodes of, of aqueous activity within within Jezero, and it never gets old to me how we are able to do sedimentology on the surface of Mars with the amazing imagers that, that we have. Um, another total eye candy image, but also very interesting geologically and from a sedimentology perspective, is the delta remnant that we call Kodiak. So the main delta remnant is, is or the main delta is, is contiguous, but in a number of places throughout the crater, we have these remnant delta deposits uh, that have in eroded away from the main deposit and are, are left behind. And so already from this distance, again, we're a couple of kilometers away, we can see both flat lying beds as well as angled uh, beds that, that seem to have kind of a tangential relationship with the underlying uh, flat beds. And this is very typical for what you'd expect in a delta sequence. And so here we've zoomed in a little bit and we interpret these deposits as the top set, bottom set, and four sets of, of a prograding delta. So on the one hand, this isn't too surprising because we knew that there was a delta in Jezero. We could see that from the orbiter images, but we're getting on the ground confirmation of the system and able to make some evaluations about and assessments of that delta system based on the size of the clinoforms and we can think about water depths and we're now able to better constrain that delta system using the observations we're getting on the ground. So while some of our delta deposits are really beautifully preserved and fantastic sedimentology to be done with them, some of our delta remnants are just big, but kind of featureless. And so this is one of the biggest delta remnants within Jezero. Um, it's a place that we call Santa Cruz, but from a distance, it looks largely featureless. And this could be because um, there's just a lot of, of scree there and or or maybe it's it's because it's composed of really fine grained uh sedimentary rocks that are just erode in that way and that's pretty typical for for what we would find on earth and maybe if we went up to it and 
brushed away some of that surface grief, we'd find a bunch of mud chips there. So it's unlikely that we'll actually go and visit this particular delta remnant, but it's been just a, a, a beautiful deposit to image. And we will at some point get closer to it, so we'll be able to take better images as well. But the the rover for the what we've done with the rover for the first couple of months is really focus on understanding the the units of the crater floor. And this next image shows um, a map of Perseverance's exploration and exploration plan. So here in the middle, we have our landing site at Octavia E. Butler Landing. Um, and then in that green box is the area that Perseverance has been exploring in the past couple of months. This is our dedicated campaign to understand the units of the crater floor. And what you can notice even at, at this scale is that within this green box, we have, and I'll trace it with my mouse and hope, hope that you guys can see it, um, but we have a pretty significant topographic and at least from orbit, perhaps geologic unit contact within this green box. Um, and so the rocks in the upper left of this green box um, tend to show really uh, diagnostic characteristic signatures of olivine, uh, olivine absorptions in, in spectral data from, from the PRISM instrument. Um, while the rocks, these kind of rubbly, uh, well-cratered rocks over here on the other part of the image and the other side of that contact, uh, tend to show typical mafic uh, mineralogy from orbit and as well on the ground um, and don't don't really light up in the, the olivine uh, bands that that we do for that we see for the other part of, of the crater floor rocks. And so we think that this is a potentially really important geologic context that could contact that could separate some of the oldest rocks in the crater from some of the youngest rocks in the crater uh, represented by uh, this cratered unit here. And so after landing, we drove south, um, kind of away from the delta, but but we'll have, head back there after we're done here, and uh, drove along here to, to better understand what these units of the crater floor look like. Um, this is one of the, the outcrops I mentioned pavers before. This is pavers part two. Again, very typical look to the rocks that we've seen uh, thus far with Perseverance, these low-lying, uh, rubbly, crumbly-looking outcrops with some cliffs off in the distance that are largely massive, maybe some hints of layering in there, but really no obvious sedimentary structures to speak of. And this has had us puzzling uh, about what these rocks could be. And even before we landed, there was a debate about whether these rocks were volcanic or sedimentary in origin. And I think as we have moved along and, and not seen really obvious examples of sedimentary structures, uh, the volcanic interpretation has, has really risen as a, a a favored or preferred interpretation for much of the team. Um, we set ourselves up uh, to attempt our first sample of the rocks of the crater floor at this location. Again, crumbly looking uh, paver stones, which again should have been a warning sign to us, um, but we went ahead with it anyway. Um, and we did our very first abrasion on Mars. And I mentioned the, that we have an abrader. And so this was what we saw when we did that. And what really stands out here um, when looking at this abrasion is, well, first of all, this is totally unexpected. As I mentioned before, the combination of dust and surface texture in those coatings really prevented us from seeing much of anything about the textures of this rock. So when we abraded it and saw this, we had a really uh, a real wow moment. And so first thing you notice is maybe these holes or voids in the rock, but then also this um, combination of, of light and dark minerals. Some of these, the, the light minerals appear to be uh, alteration of the original, uh, but we, what we see here is what most of our team has interpreted as a interlocking crystalline fabric in support of, of an igneous and volcanic interpretation. And so again, that, that's kind of the prevailing view of the team at this point. So we went ahead and attempted to uh, core this rock uh, because of, the potential to get a volcanic sample is one of the reasons why Jezzer also stood out from other Lake Delta sites with the idea that it could be sedimentary deposits and igneous deposits together in the same crater. And so we created a beautiful drill hole on the surface of Mars uh, at, a, at a target called Rubion um, and made a, a very tall little tower there of, of drill cuttings. But then when we went to go uh, measure the volume of the rock sample and the height of the rock sample uh, in inside the body of the rover, we found that the tube was empty. And so that set off a uh, investigative case to try to figure out what happened to, to this rock core. Uh, there are a number of different theories. Maybe the rock core fell out of, of the coring bit and was lying on the surface. Maybe 
it, it fell into the drill hole. Uh, and so we did imaging down the drill hole and didn't see any sign of the core either on the ground or in the hole. And then ultimately we've concluded that when we went to drill this rock, we basically pulverized it. Um, and there was nothing left uh, to be brought into the tube. And, and in fact, the tube was remarkably clean. And so we don't think any of this material ever actually made it into the tube. And now in retrospect, one of the things we noticed was you can see this dark rim perhaps around the drill cuttings. Um, and those are coarser grains there. And, and that wasn't really a, a typical thing that we saw in, in drilling on earth. But that right there could be the little pieces of our core. So when we drilled into it, we basically pulverized it. And, and it was a lesson that this rock uh, was not particularly well behaved and perhaps very different than the rocks that we had tested uh, in our extensive testing campaign here on Earth with the sampling system. So after this, we thought, OK, well, we're, we're, we have to rule out that there is something wrong with the sampling system. Um, or maybe it's just that the rocks of Mars, this particular rock, was uncooperative. And so we focused our attention next to some of those more massive resistant rocks we were seeing. And this is a great example of this is just up the slope from the Ruby on sampling attempt. And, and we have outcrops like this, which some some outcrops of it look to be some layers of it look to be more massive. Um, but it does have this kind of slight impression of of layering uh, or it could be some some kind of parting that makes it look layered. And even down here at the bottom of the outcrop, um, maybe some some finer layers here. Um, but yeah, well, we've looked at an outcrops like this and thought, OK, well, maybe if you squint and you can trace some things and your eyes can pick up patterns, maybe we're seeing sedimentary structures. But they, re again, remain largely elusive and, and not really something that we've been able to put together in a coherent way to say, yes, we think these are sedimentary rocks in a sedimentary environment. And also we've had um, a number of, of folks in our team who are very experienced in volcanic rocks put together sets of images that show that volcanic outcrops on Earth can can often look like this. There's also a very interesting uh, trail of voids here um, with a curvilinear shape that could be uh, reminiscent of, of basically vesicles or, or gas bubbles uh, here in what could be a, a volcanic rock. Um, we then drove along um, a ridge and, and a ridge that formed this potential important geologic contact between the two major units of the crater floor uh, and had rocks that that looked like this and seen in the scarp of the cliff. And so here, if you see in the little inset, uh, we were driving along this ridge called our 2B Ridge and we stopped in front of this outcrop, which is, I think, up here or up here. Um, and this is what we saw. Again, these these rocks are just just giving us the hint that they are layered, um, but without any obvious cross stratification. Um, and it's very hard for us to actually uh, determine grain size here. Again, I think as a as a result of the rubbly surface texture. So we drove by this outcrop um, and, and may very likely come back to it to use the abrading bit to see if we can actually figure out what the grain size of this rock is and, and resolve whether it is sedimentary or volcanic. So we decided that this was probably not a good rock to try for our second attempt because of the way that it was uh, had that similar rubbly crumbly texture to it. Uh, so we instead focused on some of those resistant rocks up at the top of the ridge. And this is uh, very close to where we uh, attempted our next drill it campaign and, and were success ultimately successful. So this was the view looking at the top of the ridge. And again, you see these hints of parting or what could be layering. Um, and, and we see that the, the rocks here have a dip about five degrees to the south. And so we pulled up to this area and we were really looking for a rock that looked different uh, than the Rubion rock where we uh, were unable to collect a core. And we settled on this rock because it was um, standing up tall for, well, as, as tall as it could, about 20, 20, 30 centimeters above the surface, unlike that kind of flat, low lying rock at Rubion. And we also noticed that instead of those kind of soft rounded edges, it had these very hard angular sharp edges characteristic of the way that hard rocks on Earth like to break. We also noticed that instead of that crumbly surface texture, it's actually pretty smooth. And we see those flutes and grooves suggesting that this rock uh, has been subjected to billions of years of Aeolian abrasion uh, and has survived it all. And this rock also looked like it was big enough to fit both an abrasion patch as well as up to two cores. Uh, so we decided to go for it. And we had we did have a conversation amongst the team about, well, OK, this is a piece of rock that is is obviously displaced from where it was originally deposited. Um, but because we were able to kind of connect it back up to this part of where it seemed to have fractured off this this piece of rock here 
And the fact that we have this uh, set and series of blocks all arranged along this dipping layer gave us pretty good confidence that this rock is not too far from where it was originally in place. So we attempted another abrasion, and this is what we saw. Again, we have that um, combination of light and dark minerals. We have some voids in the rock that look to be filled with a white mineral. Uh, Sherlock and Pixel tell us that some of these white minerals are salts, like um, calcium sulfate, magnesium sulfate. We see some, some sodium chloride in the previous abrasion. Um, and, and possibly even uh, some detections of, of some carbonates, but we're still working out those details. Um, the other thing you'll notice here about this rock are the brownish um, parts to it. And so what we've come to understand is that these rocks are, are significantly altered and have seen sustained interaction with, with groundwater. This, this view also gives a great view of those purple coatings that we see, um, but they look to be very thin and you can even map their edges. So then we went ahead and, and said, OK, well, we successfully did an abrasion. This rock seems pretty hard and we have some good targets here. So we went for our first uh, our first attempted core. And here you see the flash back and forth. We, we made another great hole. This time the drilled tailings fell down the side of the rock. And we were thrilled to find out that there was indeed a co an intact rock core uh, within the drill bit. And so this was an amazing image to get down. And we all breathed a sigh of relief uh, when we saw this. And so we sealed up that rock sample, which we call Mont Denier, uh, into tube 266. And this is a compilation of images taken by the cache cam inside the body of the rover while the, the sample is moving through the different stations within the rover and, and getting sealed. And so what you see there at the end is the seal on the sample tube. And so Mars sample return has officially begun. We have a strategy um, on the Mars 2020 team that will likely put down one or more caches of, of samples. We think we'll, we'll certainly put one down in Jezero, but we may put down another cache um, outside of Jezero if we're able to get there um, that we would want to have contain samples both from Jezero as well as what's beyond the crater. Um, and so we have a strategy where we decide at, at each of our high priority science locations to acquire a pair of samples. And so just two days ago, we, we tried again on the same block and were successful at acquiring a second core uh, that we call Montagnac. Um, from this rock that we call Rochette. And so now we have those two rock samples in, in the bag um, and ready to move on to our next target. So here's the, the tally of our sample collection right now. We have the, the empty ruby on, on tube. It's empty in the sense that it doesn't have uh, a rock in it, but it does have Martian atmosphere. And so there is, there is good science to be done with uh, the contents of that tube as well. So we consider that uh, to be an atmospheric sample. Uh, we then have our two rock cores from the crater floor, Montagnier and Montagnac. Um, and so looking ahead, um, we are headed into the other unit of the crater floor, um, those olivine bearing and olivine rich rocks that I mentioned. And initial uh, indications from uh, the SuperCam instrument so that these rocks may have upwards of 20 to 30 weight percent olivine, which is, uh, sorry, magnesium, which suggests that there's a lot of, these aren't just olivine bearing, but are actually olivine rich rocks and ultramafic rocks. And so that's pretty interesting as we work to understand, you know, what is the origin of these rocks um, and, and how do they relate to the rocks that we think are best interpreted as volcanic lava flows up at the top of, of the crater floor ridge there. But looking out into this area that we call Sita, which is this mitten-shaped outcrop, um, we see this, uh, which certainly got us excited from a sedimentology perspective. We have these uh, sequences of thin and thick beds, um, particularly at the top of ridges within the Sita area. And we see this also a, a well-layered, thinly bedded uh, facies as well that has this kind of nodular look to it. Um, and so this is pretty intriguing to us. And so we are, one, now that we are done with our sampling at the Rochette block, we actually plan to drive today and we are headed off in the direction of the Sita outcrop, uh, hoping to better understand the origin of these olivine rich rocks that may or may not be uh, well layered and bedded with some potential for interesting uh, structures and textures within them. And so after we explore, um, 
state, the Seta area and the, the rocks of the crater floor, um, we're going to, at this point we've, we've chosen, this was a routes we were originally considering where we're considering both the clockwise and counterclockwise route from the landing site to the delta. At this point, while we've rounded the tip of the thumb here of this mitten shaped outcrop, it's actually faster and more efficient for the rover to go back to the north. So that's our plan is to go back to the north around this outcrop and wind ourselves up right out at the front of the delta and then begin our delta campaign. We'll then explore the different facies of the delta and then transition into exploration of these marginal carbonate bearing units around the inner rim of the crater. And at that point, likely be in the position to put down our first sample depot. And so we've got lots of, of miles to put or kilometers to put under the wheels. And so we're excited to get moving again um, and lots still to explore of the crater floor we're very much looking forward to exploration of the Delta, which was one of the main reasons why we came to Jezero Crater. So I'll end there and I'm happy to take any questions in the remaining minutes. 